All right. Team Age TV here in St. Paul. Welcome to Minnesota. One of my favorite authors, uh, libertarians, Austrian economic minds is here. Tom Woods. Tom, it's great, great to meet you. Welcome to Minnesota. I know, you, I know you've been here a few times. So I figured I'd uh, take it just a couple minutes, ask him a few questions. And here, you know, right off the bat, what do you think about Minnesota? I know it's a little cold here. Uh, what brings you into town? Well, all I can say is I, I've never had a bad event here. I always get big crowds. We had this great event here at O'Gara's, and uh, I, I guess all the cool people were here. You know, from what I could see, it really seemed cool. But, yeah, I came in town for this. I had an event at a church earlier today, and everything's great. I mean, I, I was here, of course, I was in Minneapolis, that is to say, in 2008 for the Rally for the Republic that Ron Paul had, and that was like the most thrilling moment of my life to be part of that thing. I saw it on video. I on mean, video. I mean, t t the talk about political theater across the street, practically, you know, uh, from where they were having the Republican convention. Ron Paul's holding his own convention. No, I won't endorse John McCain. I mean, awesome. <laughs> Bla awesome. Blazing trail. Oh, it was great. Well, Tom here wrote uh, several books which influenced me, and one of the topics which I have to give this man almost 100% credit for introducing to me is the concept, which is not new, it's very old, of nullification. And um, actually, Wisconsin in the Civil War, correct, is a great example of nullification with the yeah. fugitive. Why don't you real quick just tell the viewers, that's, that's what revolutionized my mind as far as nullification. So what did they well, do? Well, anytime you, ever, you talk about the states at all, everybody you get accused of supporting slavery and all these yes. wicked things. But the reality of U.S. history is almost exactly the opposite, because in the 1850s, Wisconsin felt like there were some parts of the Fugitive Slave Act that were unconstitutional, so they're not going to enforce it. And there was a runaway slave who got up to Wisconsin, and his master's all upset, you've got to return him, and they refused to allow the federal marshal to take him back, they liberated him, they got him away, and they, they justified this on the grounds that the state should not have to enforce an unconstitutional law, and this is a violation of our state sovereignty, we're not going to let you do it. Now that's the opposite of what you'll hear on TV, yes. which is the states, woo, right? And look, the states are pretty stinky too, but in this case, they were actually using the principles of liberty. So, and that's that's a great, thank you, that's a great prelude, and I'm going to try to piggyback on that question, because my age group, I'm 20 years old, you know, I'm thinking of the nullification coming from these movies where there's a crime in this movie, right? The state, police, whoever, they, they got it on lockdown, and then the feds come in, and the feds say, back off, the feds are here, we have this, right? The feds are always supposed to trump national as far as the propaganda in my age group is exposed yeah, to, so right. once I found out about uh, what Wisconsin did around the Civil War times of nullification, I thought... Who really has the power? The states, the federal government, a mixture of both? So what do you say as far as modern issues that are evolve around this? Well, basically what it all boils down to is what will public opinion stand for? I mean, if the public is really not going to let the federal government intervene, then they won't. Then they can't. If the public is not going to rally behind a nullifying state, then that's just what's going to wind up happening. But when you have the case of Washington and Colorado with the marijuana laws, where yep. they're basically decriminalizing it, it is so clear that that is being supported across the board by people of all stripes, even by Obama's own base is supporting these laws. How is he realistically going to go in there and keep throwing kids into cages for these, for these infractions when they are legal under state law and everybody supports the state law? It's much more likely what the actual outcome that we've seen is what we should have expected, where the president says, well, I have other fish to fry. I'm not going to deal with that. That's exactly what can happen when you have issues where the, the, what the state is doing is so popular with the public and what the federal government would potentially do is so unpopular that the executive branch decides we have a lot of things we want to carry through. We don't have the political capital to expend on this. We're just going to look the other way. How do we hold local people accountable? I mean, should I keep writing letters to the representatives and hopefully they blow their nose on it or something? Or what other options do we have? You know, I want to be involved. Well, I'll tell you that all these local legislators now are hearing about nullification. They're getting cop. I mean, people are sending copies of my book, Nullification, to these... Le I mean, there are states where every state rep got one, and then some of them are outraged that such... Such propaganda would be on there. This is subversion, ladies and gentlemen. This is sedition that you're giving me. But they're spreading the word. They're holding events. They're demanding it. Even though none of these right-wing radio people even dare to mention, you're not going to hear this on Sean Hannity. He's going to say, oh, yep. be a good little citizen and wait for the Supreme Court to solve all your problems. Well, you know, some of us are a little more impatient than that. So it basically is that people are going ahead with it and demanding it and publicizing it anyway. Like, for example, in Kansas, we just had the Second Amendment Protection Act sort of okay. thing that went through. 
And that was in large part because these groups in, in Kansas were demanding it, demanding it, demanding it. And now that the Justice Department has said, you can't do that, we can have any gun control or gun registration legislation we want, uh, apparently the governor of Kansas, Brownback, came out with a sharply worded rebuke saying basically go take a hike we're going to stick with our law and that's only because it's not because he you know one day decided that maybe this is the right thing to do right. it's because he's getting called constantly right. and he's, he knows that even his own base now is demanding it He's forced to represent the people He's who put him in power. To, yeah. Jeez, yeah, what a, yeah, what a terrible gonna, idea, exactly. man. The people are now have to force the representatives What's to... What's happening with this system? <laughs> yeah. I like... All right, man. Well, let's transition to, like, the last subject here, which is probably what's most near and dear to me. You know, I just traveled to Iran. I was talking to Tom a little bit that earlier. That's awesome. And, you know, it's one of those things that really... Um, you know, I've traveled around Europe, and it made me love Minnesota more and see things around the world more. But Iran, I mean, the people, to, real quick, they love Americans there. And I think the only, you know, they all want to talk politics. <laughs> after, well, after what's been done to them. It was amazing, know? but I'll tell you what, they all want to talk politics, foreign policy, and one person out of hundreds I met used the word Obama. And it blew me away when I was leaving because I thought they all were sharp, it, but at the same time, they didn't care who the puppet was, who the figurehead was. Right. They just knew that these planes are coming over, these boats are coming over, they're not right. getting the medicine, they're not getting the food, their right. capital's being scrunched in there. Right. Remind right. me, of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I like to use the analogy of Japan before World War II, stopping, you know, freezing the credit yeah, and all that. Yeah. That's, what it, that's what it kind of felt like to me, but they still loved Americans. So uh, my question to you, I guess, having your expertise here is, what do people, uh, how, how do people promote a non-interventionist foreign policy? I mean, you could tell them, just go read the Founding Fathers. You could tell them a host of different things. What angle do you suggest for people my age? I mean, I'm going around trying to discuss these things with people, but the non-interventionist foreign policy, I, I have to admit, I'm influenced by Ron Paul more than anybody else. He was the guy who got me into that, and it seems... Once it hits you, it seems like common right, sense. Right, it you does, know? it does. Well, this is one of these questions where you have to understand who your audience is. It depends on the people you're talking to. Sure. So if you're talking to somebody who's just sort of middle of the road, doesn't have any strong opinions, that's one thing. If you're talking to a conservative Sean Hannity listener, that's a whole different thing. Now, for those people, I actually recommend the foreign policy chapter in Ron Paul's book, The Revolution, A Manifesto, because yep. it's written for them. Okay. And, and basically it says, look, just you know that when you intervene in the economy, there are unintended consequences. Why would this rule not hold in foreign policy? Secondly, why would you think it would be unthinkable that Iranians would dislike Hillary Clinton as much as you do? You know, like, why are you offended at this? They hate America. Well, you hate Hillary Clinton, too. Right, right, right. You know, like, what's the, you know this is like great peoples of the world unite, you know, despising the regime, right? You hate this government, too. But, I mean, I, I, would, I would also try to explain the blowback thing and say, you're not, you know, forget this stupid juvenile blaming America thing. I'm not, I'm not blaming the Rocky Mountains. I'm not blaming the population of Los Angeles. The New York I, Yankees. I am saying, yeah, right, exactly, yeah, apple pie was responsible for, no, I, I am saying that when you attack people, they get ticked off at this. Yeah. Think of what would happen if you were attacked, what you would do. And it doesn't mean that, therefore, it's good for these people to attack innocent people. Of course that's wrong. Of course that's evil. Nobody's supporting that. But, you know, when you stick your head in a hornet's nest, you have no right to say, I have no idea why I just got stung here. You know, or, or you know, you leave your car keys on your Mercedes and you walk away. And you can't believe that, okay, the thief still shouldn't have done that, but don't be an idiot. You know, and the same thing here, but, but I would also then think, if they're talking about the average person, I like what Lou Rockwell said recently, humanize the demonized. Think about the, the, the country that is in the crosshairs of the regime, like Iran right now. Sure. And we're all sort of, like, no one ever sees any footage of, of Iran. Right. So everybody just thinks, well, those are all a bunch of American hating Arabs. They don't even know they're not Arabs in Iran. Right, They're right. so ignorant. Right. right? They're a bunch of towel heads over there. Exactly. You know, but if you actually see images of them, you know, these are regular people who are pursuing their jobs, who are not preparing for the end of the world. You'll notice they're not. They're not preparing for. Well, soon we're going to nuke the the Americans, and and even though we're going to be nuked in response, it's worth it to get them. Like no one's preparing any shelters. No people are just going about their lives. They're just regular people, and and you have to understand. I mean, these are the people, the, the people with with kids who are going to. Who are going to be suffering this? And you know, when I would, I'm kind of a sappy person, very sentimental. And I remember there are there are times when, like, I'm bringing the garbage out to the curb at night, and it's as quiet as can be. You can hear a pin drop out there. And I think to myself, what would it be like to be hearing 
air raid sirens going yeah. on and knowing that any moment my kid could get her limbs blown off and she'll be sitting there in my arms and there'll be nothing I can do to comfort or save her. And it's not through any fault of hers or any fault of mine, just two regimes don't like each other. Right. Like, you can't do that. To other, like, even if you perceive that somebody is your enemy, there are still some things you just can't do to those people. And what the U.S. government, no matter which party's in charge, is planning to do to Iran is just one of those things. And you can talk about nuclear weapons and do they have them or not, but this readiness for war, this, yeah, this is like some awesome video game that I'm enjoying, I could watch on TV on the news. You gotta, you gotta say to people, that's just not, it's not right to cheer for, for widows and orphans being created, you know? I mean, be a human being for a change. Don't be Dick Cheney, and don't be John Kerry. Don't be all these shape-shifting lizards. You know, who, by the way, once in a while, I think maybe there's something right. to that. <laughs> right, Because a normal person right. would not act like this. Right. And, and just... You know, for once in your life, shut off the TV and, and set a match to the New York Times and just think like a human being. Start all over again. Forget everything you've been told about we're, we're us and we're awesome and they're them and they're... Just stop that for a minute. These are human beings. You can't have this visceral hatred for them that when John McCain sings about bombing them, you go, yeah, John, you give them... Every American should have risen up and said, you should resign immediately your Absolutely. position. Absolutely. Disgrace this country. Yeah. It's my foreign policy coach here. I'm very impressed with that last answer. That is gold right there. Oh my, Thanks. this is like awesome to me. Too good. All right, so I have to ask, you have to answer this as simply as possible. All right, 50 plus years of embargo on Cuba made the people A, better, or B, worse. Oh, much worse. Oh, boo, um, I agree with of this course. man. Oh my God, I love this. <laughs> I know that's 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 what I would tell people that travel to Iran, and I love the that was just my little joke or whatever. But honestly, like a lot of people were saying, oh, it, it wouldn't matter. The embargo doesn't matter. Cuban embargo, and I'm like, Thomas Jefferson was the dude, right? Don't have allies, don't have entangling alliances, but trade with everybody. But also, it allowed Castro to blame all the problems of communism on the embargo. Actually, that's a not that complex answer, but very very true because I think that that you can explore that for, for yeah. hours. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's a, it was a scapegoat. You know, yeah. this state, every, if you have two states doing something like that and one's the embargo, it's like this quiver of arrows that never runs out. Right. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I guess. yeah, yeah. That's right. All right, so my last question is, right. if, if I could fundraise, call up Adam Kokesh, call up these, these dudes in Minnesota that, that look up to you, like myself, that read your books, if I could fundraise enough to get you a week-long trip to Iran, would you do it? I love the idea in theory, but I got kids, and I can't. I You're right, be, I couldn't fundraise for them. That'd be a lot of money. I, I can't be away for, for, for a week. I just can't to anywhere, no matter how worthy it is. It's tongue and but, It's sincere, but it's no, also tongue-in-cheek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas Adam has no kids. And, hey. I, and, I, and I, remember, I remember him actually saying to me one time, yeah, I don't ever want to have kids. I'm telling you, Adam, if you're watching this, you are missing out on one of the most beautiful glories of life. Okay, man, you've got to rethink that. Okay? You know, light up your joint and open your mind. Whatever you need to do to rethink that. This interview goes out to Adam <laughs> Kogesh, man. We're, we're trying to have you, make you have some kids. I know you're in a long-distance relationship or something, but this is Tom. What, pound it. Have some kids. Uh, Non-interventionist foreign policy. Study nullification, kids. That's about the number one thing that I took from this guy. It's the easiest thing to grasp. Uh, War of 1812, Fugitive Slave Act of Wisconsin. Uh, open your minds up. Read Tom Wood's books, and it's a pleasure having him in Minneapolis. Team H TV, peace out. Thanks, Tom. All right. That was awesome.